Hey, everybody. My name is John Gilliard. I'm an intensivist that uh, covers ECMO at Wake Forest uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I want to welcome you guys to our COVID-19 webinar from CHEST. This is ECMO for Severe COVID-19 Clinical Controversies and Lessons Learned. We've got uh, several panelists that will uh, be answering questions. Uh, hopefully this will be a discussion. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat so that uh, uh, we can get these to our panelists. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have Craig Rackley, Kara Agerstrand, Eric Osborne, and Neil McIntyre. If you guys want to introduce yourselves, I'm Kara Agerstrand. I'm an associate professor of medicine uh, at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, a New York Presbyterian Hospital um, in New York City. I'm director of the medical ECMO program here, um, where I've been on faculty for the last nine and a half years. So I'm Neil McIntyre. Uh, I'm a professor here at Duke University. I've been here for going on 40 years now and uh, uh, have watched the evolution of uh, respiratory life support uh, really dramatically change over the last uh, several decades. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here discussing the latest innovation, that of extracorporeal life support. Thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, John, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, welcome everyone who's joining us. We're uh, delighted to have you participate in this discussion. My name is Eric Osborne. I'm a uh, ECMO physician from the uh, military. I was um, happened to be in Germany about 15 years ago and started using the cardio help and some of the uh, best machines um, many years ago in Germany and uh, helped uh, create some of the military's uh, ECMO programs over there. And then um, recently was at uh, Innova as the medical director of their ECMO program and helped uh, grow that. And um, now I'm uh, working at, uh, down in Richmond uh, with uh, HCA at uh, their ECMO uh, program and doing some consulting. So I'm happy to be here. And um, we've been fortunate to be able to see the ECMO grow in as successful ways during the COVID pandemic. Hey, I'm Craig Rackley. I'm the medical director of the ECMO program, the medical ECMO program here at Duke University uh, Medical Center in North Carolina. Um, we've sort of been trying to figure out how to do ECMO for the last uh, 12, 13 years in, in our ICU for respiratory failure. And, and just when we thought we kind of had things running smoothly, COVID-19 came along. And I think we've all learned um, learned a lot and been humbled uh, and dealt with a lot of issues over the past couple of years. So hopefully we can share some of our experiences and insights and, and help you with this, uh, with this um, topic. Great. Well, we'll jump right in. Uh, Dr. McIntyre, this question's for you. What do you consider to be the best quote unquote, conventional management options for COVID-19 patients with hypoxia? Well, uh, this is a question that gets asked a lot. Um, back when the pandemic uh, first hit us uh, almost two years ago now, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, questions uh, that were raised. Is COVID in fact, is COVID respiratory failure in fact ARDS? Uh, does it need different strategies? than what we use for conventional or traditional uh, ARDS. And uh, a lot of speculation, a lot of opinion, a lot of stuff on social media, uh, but not a whole lot of really good scientific data. Uh, as time has gone by, I think, at least in my mind, it's become pretty clear COVID is indeed ARDS. It meets all the Berlin criteria. It's a type of ARDS. There are many types of ARDS. Uh, it often has a uh, uh, at least in the beginning, a less inflammatory component and a more vasculopathy kind of component. But if you look at all the trials in ARDS, vent management, respiratory management over the last two decades, you can easily see, at least I can easily see, that uh, uh, the COVID pathophysiology uh, was, was included in all those studies. 
And that's my way of saying that I think the evidence base for ARDS we've established uh, uh, over the last couple of decades really should apply to um, really, really should apply to COVID. Uh, we want to limit the plateau pressures. We want to limit the tidal volumes. We want to use rational PEEP FiO2 combination tables. Uh, we've got newer ways of looking at lung mechanics like the driving pressure and the stress index. And um, those we're using in regular ARDS, I call it regular ARDS. There is no such thing as regular ARDS. Uh, I'll say other types of ARDS. And again, I would point out uh, uh, that the clinical trials on all these management strategies included phenotypes that look just like COVID, that look just like COVID. And I think these calls for novel ventilatory strategies, uh, novel techniques, uh, bigger than normal or bigger than usual tidal volumes are really unfounded. And I would uh, recommend anybody uh, to take a look at a, a wonderful editorial written now uh, almost a year ago, April of 2020, by Todd Rice in the Blue Journal, that I think uh, uh, explains this position very, very well. So summary, uh, I don't think we need to change our basic strategies for COVID. Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, lung protective approaches that have served us well uh, should be serving us well in COVID. And uh, uh, until other studies come out that say I'm wrong. Uh, what is it? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Now, do you, uh, do you have anything that maybe non-ECMO centers should be doing uh, to try and minimize progression to a patient needing uh, VV ECMO? Yeah, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one too. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it's been very interesting. A number of ad, what I call adjuncts have been uh, developed over the last several years uh, for uh, more traditional forms of ARDS, going in the prone position, judicious use of neuromuscular blockade, um, uh, uh, and uh, fluid management strategies. Um, it's been sort of interesting. The, the, the use of those strategies in severe ARDS was, has been slow to progress. Um, and uh, what I found very, very striking was uh, a uh, survey done uh, published in critical care medicine a few months ago, uh, looking at the use of these adjuncts uh, after the COVID pandemic hit. And it's remarkable. Uh, in severe ARDS from COVID, uh, the use of prone positioning, the use of neuromuscular blockers uh, has, if you pardon the word, skyrocketed. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I should uh, I should throw high flow nasal cannulas to prevent intubations into the mix. And those are all things those are all things that can be done uh, in non-ECMO centers to, uh, uh, to assist in the management of COVID respiratory failure. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Agerstrand, anything to add to that? You know, I totally agree with what um, Dr. McIntyre said. I think that um, really capitalizing on our current evidence-based standard of care management for ARDS is certainly key. You know, most of my job, I tell people, is actually saying that, you know, we don't need ECMO for this degree of ARDS. What we need to do is optimize the things that we know work, you know, higher P paralysis, um, neuromuscular, or excuse me, um, prone positioning in particular um, when appropriate. And um, I do agree that, you know, certainly during this pandemic, we've seen the use of high flow nasal cannula sort of, um, you know, increase in frequency. And I do think it's probably helped keep many people from actually getting intubated um, um, and, 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 you know, uh, hopefully, you know, seeing some benefit in that way. Sure. So John, sure. John we were talking before we came live here uh, about uh, some of the uh, uh, medications that might be used before people hit, uh, hit the ICU. Eric, you were, you, you, you were sharing some, uh, some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, thank you, and thanks for the nice review of ARDS. Um, we were, I was talking about, um, so there's a lot of medicine, there's a lot of information out there, and I think when we're thinking about which medicines may be helpful, I think it was, where are you in the COVID? Is it the, you know, phase one where it's just the viral phase, and those patients aren't particularly sick? That's one group of patients. What we are talking about here in this, in this, panel is severe ARDS. So that's, you know, stage two or stage three, where you've gone from the viral phase to the hyperinflammatory phase. And if you look at, there's 
There's seven uh, randomized controlled studies that show steroids work. I think we've all accepted that, you know, the dose and the duration. We're trying to stick to 10 days based on the medicaid based on the evidence, but some places go longer or 10 days or till they get off the off of ECMO or get better. Um, we're, we're recently um, encouraged by the uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine article back from in October, where they looked at uh, baricitinib and standard of care um, for ECMO patients and for patients on ventilators. So giving it later during the hyperinflammatory phase, and that did confer a modest survival benefit in a prospective randomized double-blind trial. It was only 100 patients, but it was encouraging. And for people that are stuck on the vent or they're on ECMO and not getting better, it's nice to have something that, that might help in addition to best critical care practice. Dr. So, Rackley. Uh, Jack and Heather, go ahead. One, uh, um, thanks for that, uh, Dr. Osborne. Dr. Rackley, one of the uh, audience members has asked the question of, is there any uh, use in inhaled nitric or inhaled flow land? Should they be investing in this and using it on their patients? Yeah, thanks, John. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that many centers will have the use of either inhaled nitric oxide or ifoprostenol as part of their, their protocol. Uh, and the, the evidence that's out there shows some improvement in oxygenation, but not really any outcome measure. I think of them very much as a bridge to something else. Um, we will occasionally use that to help us transport a patient from another hospital to ours um, for initiation of ECMO in our center where we have the ability to put someone on ECMO. Um, inhaled nitric and epoprostenol are not really part of our, our algorithm. Uh, I don't know that they provide enough of a proven clinical benefit to warrant, um, warrant the use for severe ARDS, uh, especially in that early phase where you're just trying to improve some of the hypoxia. Um, but other centers use it. I think other centers um, sort of will advocate that. Um, but I think that the evidence don't really, doesn't really support it and, and we don't use it as part of our kind of standard algorithm for, for someone like that. Um, and, and I just wanna get back to one last thing as we talk about the pre, uh, pre-ECMO stuff. Um, that I would I'd sort of pose to Dr. McIntyre and the rest of you guys is um, one thing I've seen a lot of over this pandemic is the, and heard it many times, uh, Neil and I did a ventilator course a few months ago, and the, the statement of every time we put these patients on the ventilator, they die came up a number of times. Uh, and I think that perception uh, is out there. And as a consequence of that, I've seen a lot of prolonged non-invasive ventilation and high flow oxygen in patients uh, with fairly severe ARDS based on the, the rationale that if they go on a ventilator, they're not, not going to survive. Um, and I don't know if, if Neil, you want to speak to some of the physiology and your, your thoughts on sort of using non-invasive ventilation for ARDS or prolonged periods of time prior to intubation and how that might um, factor into um, later needing ECMO. Yeah, yeah, I think your comments are not unique to COVID. Uh, um, we have learned that uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, can prevent intubations in COPD in particular, and it's been used there for probably over a decade uh, with a fairly strong evidence base. NIV has never really worked well in hypoxemic respiratory failure. I noticed in the chat, somebody said, maybe helmet NIV might, uh, might be better. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, the helmet is, a, is kind of an awkward device to use, and the uh, evidence is, uh, is, is somewhat positive, but uh, 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 not that strong. Um, I think what's interesting is that the use of the high-flow nasal cannula uh, has proven to be, I think, a better preventer, if you will, of intubations and hypoxemic respiratory failure. That high flow produces a little bit of CPAP, it washes out dead space, and it really does seem to help in those, uh, in, in, in those situations. You raised the interesting question about um, uh, unnecessarily delaying intubations. And I think that's a really important point. Um, 
we have learned that actually the outcome of well-managed uh, uh, respiratory support in COVID um, is as, it's very similar to what we see in other forms of ARDS. It is not a death sentence to be put on a ventilator uh, with, uh, with, with COVID respiratory failure. And uh, uh, I, I, I think we're becoming more comfortable putting in the tube when it should be put in and not unnecessarily delaying it. Uh, I know, Craig, when you do rounds, you love to t teach the uh, ROCKS index. And um, uh, I think that's a very uh, uh, interesting approach uh, to try to score what the likelihood of surviving uh, with or without the ventilator, or what, I guess I didn't phrase that right, uh, whether you ought to abandon these uh, non-invasive techniques. Um, can you share perhaps how you use the ROCKS index since I've, since you're the one who was, uh, uh, talks the most about it at Duke? Yeah, and, and I think Eric actually turned me, uh, turned me on to this. And then I know there are many, many great questions in there that um, people have that's more ECMO related that we'll be moving on to very soon. Um, but this is an important topic that I think comes up. I, my concern is the prolonged period of high level of oxygen, high respiratory effort, high respiratory drive, high tidal volumes prior to the ventilator actually worsen, may worsen the course. Uh, and we all really take that into account when thinking about someone's a candidate for ECMO. I believe uh, most of us all kind of believe seven days of non-invasive ventilation is as bad or perhaps worse of a predictor of how a patient is gonna do on ECMO than seven days of lung protective ventilation uh, on a ventilator. Uh, so trying to simply delay that on high non-invasive support, 100% may not be in the best interest of, um, of the patients. And we really take that into account when deciding whether or not someone is a quote unquote candidate uh, for ECMO. And the ROCKS index is, is just, a, just a way to, to um, sort of numerically gauge how fast they're breathing and how much oxygen they're on. So their work of breathing is kind of placed into a score that can kind of help you determine whether or not they're likely to need intubation and doing it earlier, they tend to do better. Thanks so much for that. Uh, this is a great time to segue into candidacy for ECMO. Uh, Dr. Agerstrand, you mentioned earlier that a lot of times you're trying to tell people no, uh, what, what are your criteria for putting people on? Well, I'd say trying to tell, no, tell them no um, until we optimize uh, right. sort of standard yeah. of care yeah. ventilation. Let, let me uh, specify that. Um, but certainly, you know, if somebody does meet criteria for ECMO, be it with COVID ARDS or non-COVID ARDS, which I think we did used to see at some point in time, um, you know, we really try to adhere to the evidence that we have out there. And that best evidence, you know, at this point comes from our two randomized controlled trials in ECMO, most recently and most specifically um, as a... Um, you know, is for being useful and guiding us, I think is the EOLIA trial, you know, where we certainly consider patients with a PDEF ratio less than 80, a pH less than 7.25 with hypercapnic acidosis, um, with the caveat that is once uh, conventional management, including prone positioning, and especially prone positioning, I'd say if the patient's appropriate, you know, has been attempted. If someone meets criteria, we would want to proceed with ECMO, you know, as soon um, as possible um, and not delay that, you know, for several days after that fact in order to really, you know, minimize the time that they may be exposed to injurious levels um, um, of oxygen or, um, uh, or pressures on the ventilator. Um, you know, specifically, I think criteria uh, for ECMO, um, candidacy or criteria for ECMO really varies center to center. Um, but, you know, we do know that in general, patients who are, you know, overall younger, overall with fewer comorbidities, um, you know, not um, particularly or profoundly immunosuppressed, those who haven't suffered pre-ECMO cardiac arrest are ones that tend to do better. Um, there are obviously exceptions to all those, um, um, those, those um, conditions that I mentioned, but um, you know, certainly, um, and particularly with COVID, um, you know, I think we've seen maybe patients older, uh, those with multiple comorbidities, those who have been intubated for a much longer duration of time, um, really not fair as well as we would hope that they may, and that, and maybe would not do as well as they would had they been in the same uh, scenario with non-COVID related ARDS. Great. 
Uh, Dr. Osborne, have your criteria changed at all since the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, yes, they have. And uh, I'll, I'll say uh, we have a sophisticated audience because uh, looking at some of the questions, there's some excellent questions that have come up. And um, they absolutely have. I think uh, the criteria that, that uh, Dr. Agerstrand used are there are differences, there's subtle differences in criteria among the big centers, but most of us are pretty similar. Uh, what happened with COVID, and it's, um, it, it, you had to switch from, you know, what's best for each individual patient, because we're in a global pandemic and we knew we were going to get overwhelmed. So the, the perspective, the paradigm changed. It was no longer what's best for this individual patient, but what is best for this group of patients and what will allow us to use our limited resources in the way that will save the most lives. And that it's almost a combat medicine mentality. It's a triage medicine mentality because we know we had limited ECMO beds. We had limited, and I believe that ECMO used early in patients that fail optimal, optimal therapy is the a beneficial treatment. Um, that's my belief. And we've seen that in practice. So it would behoove us to have more ECMO, but we, our ECMO beds were limited. What happened with our criteria is we got much stricter. And we got stricter because you want to use your limited resources in a way that use them on people, patients who are more likely to survive. And so that's usually younger, healthier patients. Age can be tricky because there's some, um, so normally with VV ECMO, there is not an age limit. There aren't any absolute contraindications, but for uh, COVID VV ECMO, we started off with an age limit of 60. And then as our beds got tighter, then we went down to 55. And then when we, when we got down to one or two ECMO beds, we would go to 50. And, you know, that's, it's, that's tough to do because if you're 51, you know, it's, it's a general guideline. There is no absolute numbers. We maintain flexibility. But so we used a younger age. So say 55, we used um, absence of other chronic comorbidities. So um, people that had other renal failure or were in shock or had pre-existing lung disease, they may have been um, not good as good ECMO candidates. We also use BMI, um, which usually in BV ECMO, we know uh, the larger BMI patients do just as well. If you can cannulate them, they're harder to cannulate, but, and they have the side effects that, that bigger people have, but they do quite well. But in the COVID population, given their inflammatory response, they did worse. So we used a BMI less than 40. Again, there was exceptions to all of these because we had a BMI of 52 and a 50 in a 16 um, year old and then a BMI of 49 in a 21-year-old, and they both survive. So the criteria are dynamic, and they get stricter as your capacity narrows. Um, and I have to say, it's sort of a, it's an, each institution has their own capacity challenges. And it was very hard, and we tried to do it uh, as a group, uh, not do it alone, but talk to multiple people and try to have it be as, as fair as possible understanding that in a situation where there's limited resources in a global pandemic, it unfortunately isn't always fair. Agree. I, I, you know, we looked at our own data here at Wake Forest and had to make the, some of those adjustments and, and certainly a lot of non COVID issues go into uh, those decisions, staffing, uh, availability of resources, uh, things that, uh, uh, probably few of us really have ever had to deal with, except for, like you say, in, in combat uh, in low resource environments. Uh, now, moving along to cannulation strategies, um, uh, I'll throw this out to Dr. Rackley. Uh, who cannulates? Uh, when are you guys cannulating? Where are you cannulating and how are you cannulating? So four easy questions. Who, when, where, and how? Um, so it's a great question. And I think I want to piggyback on just a little bit to what um, was discussed a second ago in terms of criteria and then, then try to answer this question. So sure. I think when we 
when we talk about criteria and candidacy, I sort of think of them a little bit separately. So it's what is the trigger at point at which point you think someone needs ECMO? Uh, and I think those are the EOLIA criteria that Kara described. Uh, and, and those were the criteria from that study. And each individual institution may modify that slightly to what they say um, is the, the criteria for needing ECMO. And then the second question is who is likely to benefit? That's the way I frame it is we're not denying someone ECMO where we, we do not think ECMO will improve their chances of survival. Uh, and we put the people on ECMO who need it, who we think it will improve their survival. Uh, and those are sort of the younger people with less, um, less comorbidity. So I think really trying to separate those two out, do they need it and are they likely to benefit? Uh, and those, those second criteria have been in flux. Um, uh, over time. Uh, and then the cannulation strategy, and, and we're lucky to have sort of a wonderful group of surgeons here that we work with. And, and we, as the other guys do, make these decisions as a team, kind of thinking about what the need is for that individual patient. Um, with VB ECMO in particular, we're trying to match as much of their cardiac output as we can to provide them the offloading support uh, of the lungs that they need. Uh, and so a patient who is large, who is young, who may also be septic may require a lot of blood flow. Uh, and those folks, we typically cannulate with two cannulas. Um, our preferred site is a femoral vein drainage catheter and a right or or typically a right IJ uh, return catheter. And we often use a, a larger 25 French drainage and a 19 or so French return, and which allows us to flow five to six liters um, uh, reasonably um, well. In patients who require less flow, um, they sometimes will be cannulated with a dual lumen catheter, either a right IJ or um, a left subclavian. Uh, others have, have utilized the, um, what's called a Protec Duo, which is a percutaneous RVAD um, device um, with an oxygenator, which is, is a different type of um, dual lumen um, single site catheter. Uh, people have often used the dual lumen when they're mobilizing patients. I think we've had a lot of experience with mobilizing patients with femoral catheters, um, that have done extremely well. Uh, so having a femoral catheter does not prevent you from mobilizing your patients as they begin to improve uh, and move forward with that. So they don't necessarily need reconfiguration of their cannulas. They don't necessarily need um, an upper extremity um, uh, site only to be able to mobilize and do rehab and all that. And we've had good experience. I know CARES had good experience with that and, and several other places. Uh, so I'm really thinking about, from a technical standpoint of the, of the surgeon, what they feel they can most safely place uh, and how much blood flow do I think I'm going to need. And that helps us determine um, how we would cannulate the, the patient. Great. Is anybody, uh, uh, Dr. Osborne or Dr. Agerstrand, are y'all using any different configurations? Uh, we mostly the same approach that Craig mentioned. We actually had moved away from a dual lumen cannula, uh, you know, several years ago, um, really due to that um, ability we found to mobilize patients with femoral cannulas, including femoral VA cannulas. We routinely walk these patients, um, even on a femoral VA ECMO configuration, um, really without, without um, significant problems. Um, and just given the logistical challenges of sometimes placing a, a dual lumen cannula, you know, whether your ICU has fluoro available, you know, the ease of getting uh, that uh, outside a referring facility in the middle of the night, or even sometimes an echo, um, you know, to help guide placement can be challenging. And so most all of our patients um, are cannulated with a two site approach. Um, similarly, we, we know these patients um, can have very large or very high um, O2 demands. Um, we've uh, moved actually during COVID uh, to really placing up to a 29 French drainage cannula 
um, in these patients in order to allow us to really optimize flow. Since we've done that, we've seen, you know, fewer patients need a need for VVV ECMO or that additional drainage cannula, um, um, you know, um, for the, the, the flow requirements they have. And I think, you know, having the ability to support them more, you know, with a, a large cannula size, as Craig mentioned, um, you know, based on their predicted and expected cardiac output will help uh, facilitate extubation in appropriate patients. I saw someone ask that, or several people have asked that in the chat, you know, do you ever extubate these patients? Um, certainly with COVID, I think it's been more challenging uh, than our non-COVID ARDS patients, but we have extubated, um, you know, a number of them over the course of the pandemic, typically those who have, you know, better pulmonary compliance, you know, relatively so speaking, you know, who have a little extra leeway uh, with their oxygenation and who were able to comfortably support on ECMO. Somebody who is maxed out on ECMO support, maxed out on the vent, in shock, in renal failure, on CRT, those are not the patients that are going to succeed um, extubated, but the ones that you have with single organ failure um, or maybe a little bit of low level shock, you know, you know, very well could, um, um, could succeed um, in that manner. Great. Yeah. Um Thanks for pointing out. We've got a bunch of great questions. Um, hopefully we'll get to most. Uh, we might not get to all, but uh, after this, we uh, will figure out a way to answer those questions, either get you guys to send them uh, to chest and we can respond. But, so moving on to uh, management on ECMO. Uh, Dr. Osborne, do you have any other ventilator management uh, pearls of wisdom that we should be doing? Thank you. Uh, excellent discussion so far. I'll just um, real quickly add in terms of the cannulation, the beginning of the, and then I'll get to the ventilator question, uh, beginning of COVID um, due to concerns about um, minimizing exposure. We were, remember, we weren't sure how transmissible it was. We did uh, fem-fem uh, cannulation, so femoral vein to femoral vein. Um, and that was where you'd have one person down in the groin and one person up at the top. Um, and that was okay. I think in terms of flow, your, your best flow can be achieved by what uh, Craig and Kara were talking about, femoral drain and then a right IJ return. You can always, we've had to probably about 10, 10 to 15 times place a third drainage, uh, a second drainage cannula. So you had VVV ECMO if you needed more flow. Uh, we have used um, relatively um, probably 30 or 40 uh, crescents, uh, 32 French crescent double lumen cannulas in smaller patients, and that has been um, successful, does help with mobilization, and uh, a little bit harder to place, but uh, once we were comfortable with um, fluoro um, and a little bit less concerned about transmission, we were able to take patients back to the uh, operating room. Um, in reference to the ventilator, um, a lot of us will say ultra lung protective settings. So that's a low respiratory rate. We'll use a respiratory rate of around eight, uh, a low tidal volume. So a tidal volume less than four cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight or predicted body weight. And then we'll keep our plateau pressure less than 24. Uh, those are consistent with the uh, pretty close to, I think, what the EOLIA trial did. Um, we would, we would go down, you know, the patients that are on very high pressures when they go on ECMO, we would incrementally come down on our PEEP and our pressures to try to avoid, avoid com complete collapse so that you're looking at maybe six to eight hours getting to rest setting. So you're coming down slowly on your PEEP. But the ventilator settings are the um, low, lower respiratory rate, lower volumes and lower pressures. Um, did have a hard time with uh, COVID because a lot of them just would breathe really fast and seemed our compliance would come back and they'd pull big volumes, but their respiratory rate was super high. So that was quite challenging. Is anybody, uh, Dr. Rackley, uh, are you guys uh, in that situation where you've got the patient whose compliance has improved and their tidal volumes are better, uh, maybe their oxygenation is even a little better. Is anybody using uh, low flow ECOR or AVCOR? Um, we have not. We have used um, ECOR in a couple of patients who were not ECMO patients, so not as a transition. Um, 
my my thought is that you are pulling two cannulas out of two vessels and putting another cannula in another vessel to do a very similar thing. Um, so are you, are we, are we simply doing something uh, to do it? I think that if you need to change cannulation strategy, you're going to have to change something out anyway. Um, and you're at that point, then, then it may very well be um useful and it may be something that we utilize much more in the future. Often they don't achieve enough CO2 clearance. Like you're not able to do enough CO2 clearance with uh, e-core devices as you can with, with ECMO. Uh, and uh, you may be left with, with just not enough CO2 clearance um, by transitioning from a device that's flowing at three or four liters to one that's flowing at five or 600 cc's. Um, per minute. And so that's what we've seen. It gives you um, a little bit, uh, but not as much uh, as ECMO. So depending on the needs. Um, and, and I think one thing that comes up that it, kind of getting at the question that we're talking about here is the conundrum most people are in is I can keep these very good lung protective settings, but they require me to have this patient sedated and paralyzed. And as soon as I wake them up, they're breathing really large tidal volumes and, um, and, and not doing as well or breathing really fast. And, and sometimes that's, there's a misconception that their compliance has actually improved, but really their lung compliance hasn't improved. They're just pulling. Uh, and if someone is sedated and paralyzed and getting a 50 CC tidal volume and they wake up and get a 500 CC tidal volume, their lung compliance hasn't improved at all but they are pulling and their transpulmonary pressure has just skyrocketed. So I think a challenge that we've all come across is at what point do we say it's better to be awake versus it's better to make sure that we are absolutely protecting the lungs. And clearly both of those carry a risk with them. Uh, if we have the lungs absolutely protected as our primary focus. We're heavily sedating this patient. We're perhaps paralyzing them. They're profoundly weak. They're at risk for all the complications that go along with that. If we have them awake and around and, and moving around, they're more protected from those, but are they going to end up with more lung injury down the road? Um, and I certainly don't have a perfect answer for that, but we try our best to find a balance of trying to blunt their respiratory effort as much as we can, trying to not wake them up with a pH of 725 where they're going to have a massive drive to breathe um, and, and trying to um, support them as best we can. But I think there's probably the person who goes from a hundred CC volume to a 500 CC volume when they're awake is causing more harm by being awake and pulling those volumes than the risk of the sedation. If there is a small increase, they go from 200 to 250, then probably the benefit of being awake is greater. And where that crosses over, I certainly don't have the answer. If one of you guys do, I would love for you to tell me. Uh, <laughs> but I think that that's, that's a problem we, we all run into. Our goal, I think I speak for most of us, our goal is to have our patients as awake as they can possibly be, walking around the unit, eating, talking, et cetera. Um, but also protecting their lungs and finding the balance between those has probably been one of the hardest parts of this, um, this pandemic. I know certainly for our group here and, and a lot of, of the others. So I'm just thinking about how much of a Delta is that as they wake up, if it's a small change, then it's probably better to be awake. If it's a massive change, it's, they're probably not yet ready until you've made some other adjustments. And I think um, to add on what Craig just said, one thing we try to do, and again, we're always also look, looking for that right balance um, and the right timing, you know, probably day one, two, or three, um, uh, you know, of ECMO are the times you really, you know, the earlier, um, once you're on ECMO, you really want to optimize that lung protection, that ultra lung protection as much as possible. And as the duration, as our ECMO course proceeds, um, you know, when the, maybe they're less hyperinflammatory is a time that it might be more prudent to have them awake. One thing we try to do and have had some success with is, you know, for example, if we have the rate set at six or eight on the ventilator, maybe the patient's somewhat awake, they're breathing over at 10 or 12 or 14, or maybe even up to 20, we say, okay, well, their gas looks great. Like they're doing well. Let's raise the sweep. Even if that gas is sort of 74040, see what happens to that respiratory rate. Like if it comes down, because now we're shifting the work of breathing from the patient to the circuit, 
even maintaining the same blood gas, you know, we have a sense that we can control some of that drive to breathe um, and, uh, you know, reduce some of that mechanical power on the lungs um, in those specific patients. And that's sort of a sign and a clue that maybe we can really shift more of that work to the circuit. They may be somebody who's able better to tolerate being awake, potentially tolerate extubation in the right scenario. Those are great points. Uh, when are you guys uh, doing trachs on your patients, Dr. Osborne? Um, I would say that, uh, so for the COVID patients, uh, where we learned pretty quickly that they were going to have longer ECMO runs, kind of like uh, H1N1, um, at the end of the first week, if it looks like they're going to, if they're not getting better and it looks like they're going to be on for a longer period of time for, you know, three weeks, four weeks, then really after one week, we will go ahead and, uh, and trach them. And um, the, if it looks like at the end of the first week, they're improving, it looks like maybe within the next week, they're going to be coming off. And that was a, a smaller percentage of patients, um, then we would not trach them. But I would say about 75% of our patients ended up getting trached um, with, uh, in, the, in the COVID population. And we did find it was helpful in terms of vent weaning and sedation weaning and um, uh, patient comfort. I was going to ask Dr. Agerstrand, what uh, with your patients that you've traked, have you found that you've been able to lighten their sedation uh, in the COVID era compared to at least uh, pre-COVID? It seemed like you could trach them and pull off their sedation, and they usually did pretty well. What's been your experience? You know, I think it's very variable between patients. Um, Certainly there are some of these COVID patients who have a really difficult time waking up, um, you know, without either having profound desaturations or having sort of extreme amounts of hypertension or sort of some autonomic liability. Um, you know, one of, if we're finding that happen in a patient who is endotracheally intubated, certainly we'll think about if a tracheostomy might help that. I think in some cases it has, you know, maybe that uh, ET tube was quite bothersome, but on some cases, even once they've been trach, we've had a difficult time um, you know, waking some of these patients up in sort of a controlled um, and calm way, despite, you know, throwing every, you know, pharmacologic agent that we, we have, you know, um, at them, or at least giving all of them a try. Okay. Dr. Rackley, uh, with your patients, are y'all doing uh, open trachs or perk trachs? We do percutaneous trach. Um, and we will often do sort of a modified perk trach uh, where the surgeon um, uses a, a bobe to control bleeding down to the trach and then uses a standard perk trach um, kit. We've done both ways and have really not noticed a major difference in that, but they're, they're all done in, in essentially a perk trach manner. Sure. Now you, you mentioned bovi and bleeding and I don't think you can get away from an ECMO talk without talking about bleeding and anticoagulation. Uh, so who uh, wants to start with this? Dr. Osborne, you look like you're smiling. Uh, tell us about your anticoagulation strategy and uh, what changes you've had to make in the COVID era. I'd be happy to. I'll, I will first... Uh... A disclaimer, the bleeding experience in COVID patients has been different around the world and different around centers. So I can tell you my bleeding experience, and we've done uh, about 120 COVID patients, uh, our bleeding experience or our clotting experience, really, when we first started back in, it was March of 2020. Um, so like, gee, that's almost two, two years ago. Um, we noticed the increased clotting. We would use our normal low heparin bolus, which was somewhere between three and 5,000 of heparin when they were cannulating. We give them the bolus, put the cannulas in, and the cannulas were full of clots. Um, and then we noticed our circuits clotting off or that they would develop clot a lot, lot sooner. Um, and then we had a very high rate of heparin resistance. So we switched to bivalrudin. Um, we would give, we switched to a a larger, just about a 
this is for us a double, you know, larger heparin bolus. So instead of 50 units per kilogram, 100 units per kilogram, and that was consistent with some of the older, what people used to use, 100, un 100 units per kilogram heparin bolus up front, and then we would go to bivalve. We would use bivalve and target a PTT of 75 to 95. The bivalve PTT in, in our lab, that was more like a heparin, a heparin PTT of probably 95 to 105. So higher, a much higher PTT than our normal VV ECMO patients. That was our experience. And we did not have a lot of bleeding. We had much less bleeding than you would usually see for VV ECMO patients that are, that are anticoagulated that way. Um, and we ended up, bivalve was very helpful for us. And it's also great because it has a shorter half-life and then it responds very well to pressure. Um, it's, it's motion dependent. So if you have bleeding, you can hold pressure and it gets better faster than if you're on heparin. Um, I will say there was just a nice uh, a review of about 400 patients out of, out of uh, Europe, Germany, and Sweden, I believe, where they looked at intracerebral hemorrhage in COVID patients, and it was higher. Again, that was retrospective, but that was their experience in Europe that they had higher rates of intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, and then using, you know, your standard anticoagulation. The, the ELSO guidelines says just use the regular, um, you know, your regular anticoagulation for BB ECMO for your COVID patients. Um, that's the official, I think, ELSO statement. You, Kara can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, and then each center has sort of adapted their own. We had good success with bival. We tracked a lot of patients. We were very worried about bleeding, but did not have we had a couple of bad bleeds, but, uh, you know, in 80 patients, two bad bleeds isn't, isn't very bad. Um, so that's, that's my experience uh, with it. Um, haven't seen a change in the different types, the variants. You know, the variants have had different survivals, I think. Our survival's gone up and down, and that's been consistent around the, the country and the world as well. There's been some variable ECMO survival rates, but... I haven't seen a big change in uh, clotting, at least in uh, Virginia. So thanks. Dr. Agerstrand, uh, how about you guys up north? You know, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we tend to run a very low level anticoagulation in our ECMO patients. In general, our, we use a heparin drip um, uh, unless there's concern for HIT. Uh, we follow PTT unless there's concern that it's uh, not reflective of their coagulation status, at which point we'll follow uh, anti-10A levels. Um, and so typically we follow a very low level anticoagulation, typically a PTT of around 40 to 60 or so. Um, in uh, our COVID population, we sort of bump that up more toward the 60 side, um, maybe uh, you know even 60 to 80. I think therapeutic levels for us starts right around 80. So um, we have sort of adjusted it slightly. Um, you know, we've also, you know, what are the consequences of this, you know, more bleeding, uh, less clotting, you know, I think it's a little bit um, kind of unclear, uh, what is the effect of the uh, anticoagulant versus um, potentially the disease itself. Certainly in the first wave, um, what prompted us to make this sort of higher adjustment was that we are seeing many patients, both uh, supported with ECMO and uh, non-ECMO patients, you know, coming in, with, you know, LV thrombus, massive PE, you know, much more so than we, I think, even see now in these later waves of COVID and whether that's, um, uh, a, you know, disease related uh, factor or variant related uh, factor versus um, just some of the uh, practices within the hospital. I think it's a little bit difficult to say, but that was what prompted us to make that change. I and mean, we probably are around a PTT of around 16, a lot of these patients um, at this point but certainly are very aggressive in looking uh, for clots. You know, we'll routinely um, uh, check ultrasounds of the upper and lower extremities if there's concern for PE or evolving right heart failure. We're certainly, you know, we'll look for that, um, you know, as well when we're able to. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rackley, are you guys having to make a lot of circuit changes uh, with the COVID patients compared to the pre-COVID era? Uh, given their, uh, you know, a lot seem to have a lot longer runs, but also their uh, um, uh, high propensity to uh, have coagulation issues. Yeah, so that, 
The short answer would be more circuit changes per patient, uh, whether or not we have more circuit changes per patient days relative to these prolonged courses and other patients, probably not much different. Um, it often you need to do circuit changes. The longer people are on ECMO, you rarely need to do it in someone who's on for two days. You're very likely to need to do it. In someone that's on for 28 days. And, and, our average run with COVID has been more in the three to four week range where previously it was in the one to two week range, um, but not a dramatic increase in, in sort of overall clot burden to the point where we're constantly changing circuits in all of our patients, uh, much different than what we would, would normally see, um, I would say. And the anticoagulation is a is always an interesting issue. I think if you asked a hundred ECMO centers how they anticoagulate, you'll get a hundred different answers. And if you get two that are the same, it's because one person learned from the other person. Uh, and so whether or not you use heparin levels, PTTs, bivalerudin, direct thrombin inhibitors, or heparin, it's, it's just honestly not clear. I would love a perfect answer on that. I think coming up with a with a good policy that you use in your center that you're always evaluating and, and adjusting based on what you have is the most appropriate approach. It may be by Valerudin uh, totally in your center. It may be heparin, it may be based PTTs, it may be heparin levels. And, and I'd, be, I'd be lying if I said that I knew any of those was wrong or necessarily superior. And we tend to run on the lower side of anticoagulation um, and, and just sacrificing the you know, a little more clotting for a little less bleeding, but uh, perfect answer. I don't know. Okay. I, uh, I, you know, it's interesting you say that uh, we, at the beginning, uh, because of um, resource issues, we, we were pretty quick to run everybody a lot thinner than we normally would because we wanted, we had to avoid circuits clotting because we didn't have any more circuits. Uh, but thankfully, we're, we're out of that. Dr. McIntyre, welcome back. Um, not to put you on the spot, but there have been a lot of questions about proning patients on ECMO. Uh, should we be doing this? Uh, <laughs> my colleague, Eric, is giving two thumbs up. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a logistical challenge, but the physiology of uh, uh, gas and or VQ matching and uh, uh, the uh, gravity effects on the lung uh, don't change because you have ECMO cannulas in you. So that um, uh, if you can do it, it's probably worth doing. Uh, uh, I know people get nervous uh, about the cannulas moving around. Uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't been up in the ICU in a, in, in a little bit. Uh, Craig, we prone them don't, on a pretty routine basis, don't we? We are proning pre-ECMO patients on a very routine basis. We are, we are implementing a protocol and beginning to do some simulation training. I, I think it's certainly something that we should be doing. And, and I think we're, we're just probably a little behind on this here and are working to, to catch up. I completely agree with Neil and, and agree with Eric's two thumbs up. I think making sure you do it safely, uh, making sure you have everybody comfortable, but it's probably something that we ought to be, um, ought to be doing. Eric, what, uh, what's your reasoning for the two thumbs up? Um, well, Dr. McIntyre explained it nicely. Um, it works very well in ECMO patients. Um, there's actually now multiple studies. Um, you know, there are observational studies, but there are multiple studies showing that it actually improves survival in ECMO patients. We were doing, even before covid at you know, three or four days for people that were not making any improvement and they're still on 100% on the ventilator and they're on, on 100% on, um, on the ECMO circuit and you're at rest settings, but their saturation uh, pulse oximetry is marginal, we would flip them over at that point. Uh, the rationale is that the same physi physiologic benefits that you get from non-ECMO patients apply to ECMO patients. Uh, there's just another tube to hold on to, uh, one or two more tubes to hold on to when you flip them over. And then, you know, we kind of advocate to have the ECMO doc in there in the beginning and just have everyone do it together 
Uh, one of the silver linings of COVID is now you can go into a cardiac ICU and they will all be proficient in proning patients. Uh, I think all the ICUs have gotten very good at proning patients. So that's made it easier for us to, to, to prone people. Great. So now switching gears a little bit, uh, moving towards weaning and decannulation. Uh, Dr. Agerstrand, how should we be looking at patients and deciding whether or not they're ready to come off of ECMO? Um, you know, I think that's a great question that comes up frequently. You know, one of the things we look for um, is certainly just overall clinical improvement. How does their x-ray look? How has that patient diarrhea? You know, what is the status of any, you know, secondary or super um, imposed infections? Um, and, you know, are we at a point where we're starting to see either potentially the tidal volumes uh, get larger um, without changes in, in the mechanical ventilator? You know, or are we starting to see their sweep requirements go down? You know, um, if somebody is, you know, several weeks, and I think as Craig mentioned, our typical COVID uh, ECMO run is, is much longer than our non-COVID ECMO run. I'd say it's been very common for us to support patients, you know, between 40 and 50 days. Our longest survivor has been on, was on ECMO for COVID for nearly 80 days and, you know, went home, not on oxygen, et cetera, and did quite well. So certainly they, these can be prolonged runs, but, but as, um, you know, that um, time course um, um, progresses, we might say, okay, let's try to, you know, increase that tidal volume. What happens to the plateau? Are those lungs recruitable now um, in a very safe manner, you know, uh, maintaining that plateau pressure that's still quite lung protective, 25, maybe 26 the most, um, you know, or um, are we able to increase um, the inspiratory pressure in a pressure control mode and, and see um, those tidal volumes really go up? Um, and are we able to empirically wean the sweep and what happens to the gas? Does that patient is that patient able to compensate without having a kind of increased work of breathing, um, you know, or concern for, you know, a patient sort of self-inflicted lung injury um, in that way. And then we will incrementally wean the sweep, incrementally wean the FDO2 over usually a, a day or two or three period. Um, and then when they're ready to come off or we think so, trial them off sweep, you know, for 30 minutes at least, um, sometimes longer, um, check a blood gas and if everything looks good, then take out the cannulas. So if I may uh, put in a plug for my dear friend, Craig, um, he and the respiratory therapists on the ICU published a wonderful uh, protocol uh, <clears throat> in critical care medicine, critical care explorations. I think it was last month that uh, uh, I, I, I think make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I, I was around uh, 20 years ago when we made the uh, the recommendation to go from pressure support and or IMV to spontaneous breathing trials with the ventilator. Uh, and I, I must admit, uh, I think a similar concept uh, uh, can be the ECMO, uh, spontaneous, uh, spontaneous trials on a regular basis to see how they do uh, with the sweep gas off. Craig, did I phrase you properly? Or Sounds beautiful. Uh... So yeah, that's what we did. We, we essentially converted a spontaneous breathing trial to a sweep off trial. And we set criteria and each night the respiratory therapist assesses the patient. If they meet those criteria, they get a sweep off trial just as they would a SBT for someone who's, who's, um, who's on the ventilator. And it, it significantly shortened our time on uh, on ECMO, I think just allowed us to recognize almost exactly like a spontaneous breathing trial. We're recognizing someone's ready more quickly than we may have otherwise. Um, and that was pre COVID, uh, when that was, when that was done, but I think the, and the COVID folks tend to take longer. We still have a similar approach, um, to doing it. So we're checking each day as they meet, um, as they meet this criteria. I think as long as you have some sort of objective protocol that you use that doesn't rely on a physician coming by each day and saying, well, I just don't think they're quite ready yet. Uh, because I think that is, that's what, uh, um, that's what, that's what will delay these courses, make it longer. You need something objective, just like um, a spontaneous breathing trial. Great, great. Uh, 
everybody, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you to Chest. Uh, our time is up. Uh, to all of the attendees, thank you so much. Uh, your questions, uh, Carla from Chest has put an email uh, in the chat. Uh, if you do have questions, please send that out. Uh, uh, send uh, that email, send those questions to that email and she will get us all of these questions uh, and, and we can get back to you. Uh, again, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, I think this was quite informative. I uh, wish everybody well and uh, stay safe, okay?